You're listening to episode 3 of the Library Tech Cast. Digital what? This episode was recorded live on Friday, September 20th. Enjoy. This podcast is a proud member of the Tech Podcast Network. If it's tech, it's here. Listen to other great tech podcasts at www.techpodcasts.com. Welcome to show number three of Library Tech Cast. Today we have DSpace. Is it for you? Yes or no? Um, let me introduce my co-host, Riley Childs. Um, a little bit about myself first. I'm a reference librarian at Concordia University in sunny Irvine, California. Let me throw it over now to Riley. Go ahead for an introduction. Hello. My name is Riley Childs. I am in Charlotte, North Carolina. Um, I am the student librarian at Charlotte United Christian Academy, and I do a lot of IT information technology work in addition to work in library technologies, where, and that's my main background. Um, and so we're going to kick it off with, uh, I guess we're going to kick it off with, uh, with the virtual library that's starting in Texas. And I'm going to throw that one over to you, Jeff. Right, so uh, I guess if you've been watching the news, the first bookless library in um, Beckar County, I guess it's uh, a somewhat low-income county within Texas, um, and, and basically the first digital library is supposed to resemble somewhat like an I, I, iTunes or I, I Apple Store, and... Um, Oh, is it, is it called the Texas Digital Library? I don't think so. Oh, it's called oh, that... Bibliotech. Oh. Have you did you read the article or? I I skimmed it. Um, I've been. Oh. Right. So Bexar so I mean, the... County. Yeah, there it is. Yeah. So basically, the idea is that uh, I think. 40% of the population ha in, in that particular location has access to the internet. So they're trying to, of course, um, not only bridge that gap, but give them a place where they can come and get help and sort of feel at home and use different devices and, and build some sort of competency on those devices. And, and from the first week or two it's been open, I think they've been reporting record number of uh, patrons coming in and using their services. And I mean, you know, any any sort of uh, library like that, even if it's not fully digital, within a low income area is gonna gonna be a boom to the to the residents there. Uh, yeah, definitely. I mean this sounds like a very, very interesting I guess just concept. I mean an all digital library. So you can go in so there's an actual location, correct? Yeah. So it looks like it, the the renderings were of you know it looks similar to an Apple Store. You know they have rows of where people can sit on stools with iPads, and they have you know computer rows and different things like that. Uh, okay, I'm trying to figure out a zip code because apparent seven eight two one two. Apparently, it just asked for a zip code. Okay. Okay, but yeah, um, yeah, I'm looking at their website, and I mean, it looks like someone sat down and really took some time on this. If I wonder what they're if they're basing it on like op Overdrive or if what they're basing it on, because is it like lending digital books as well? Is yeah, yeah. E so there's there's supposed to be um, four dozen iMac computer stations, <laughs> along with nine laptops and forty iPads. And there's even a, a Xbox gaming system, you know, within the library. And I mean, that's really not that uncommon at, at public libraries these days. Oh yeah, I, I know mean, that. At least, um... at least out here on the on the West Coast. I don't know. Do you, your local public library have a Xbox or a game? Um, we were since it's like a gigantic system with like I think it's 20 libraries. There's an uptown branch called the Imaginon branch, which is kind of like, I guess you might call it the technology branch. There's also like a theater there and stuff. Um, yeah, that's very cool. And uh, yeah, but they do. Um, okay. But yeah, also, I mean. 
Yeah, so that's the first, uh, I guess, public digital library. I, um, I, there, I was reading that there is a, a couple colleges out there that have all digital libraries, but with distance education or online education, that's sort of a must, I would think. Yeah, my only, uh, my only real qualm with this, and I think it's, um, it looks cool, and the renderings look awesome, but um, it's all Apple. Right. Oh yeah, yeah. Uh, I don't. Yeah, I don't know if they were in some kind of partnership with them. Oh, well, they do have. They they do have the lone Xbox. Let's not let's not forget that. Oh yeah. <laughs> Is it an Xbox One or an Xbox 360? Uh, it does not say. It just says an Xbox gaming system in the in the article I read. A singular Xbox gaming system. Oh. Yeah. So well, they actually say that three and four people don't have access to the internet. So that's got to be somewhat high i mean this you know in the united states where three out of four people don't have access to the internet yeah but um yeah that well, i mean i know there's a whole bunch of billboards that are up around charlotte um that say everyone on um mm -hmm. which we could get in a whole debate about about that that particular um concept but i mean i i just don't want to go through that because I have opinions on that, and I'm sure a lot yeah, of other we people could, do. Yeah, we could we could take a show where we could delve into you know internet yeah. access and what it means for people, and and you know like we were talking about last week, the iPads in schools. I mean, how much advantage are these students getting compared to students who don't have access to that kind of technology? And I mean, only only time will really tell. And you know, there I'm sure people are going to start conducting studies on you know, where, what kind of technology people have experienced before they've gone to college or before they've entered the workforce. Yeah, because, I mean, it's really these, um, because, I mean, the influence of technology on, because we're moving into a world where there's, it's, you either are able to use a computer or you're basically not going to get a job. Um, and right, 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 right. It's, it's very, very important that you're able to, to be able to use this. And I think it's also a matter of are the iPads helping with their education or are they just like a gimmick? Because I know here, in my opinion, the, um, the public school, the, the school district rollout of like iPads and bring your own device – I think that personally, I think that might have been more of a publicity yeah. stunt. Right. Like oh. That because I remember that. Um, I mean, I'll be impressed when they start introducing coding, you know, to middle schoolers or you know fifth graders. I would, I would be, you know, and if that comes along with a computer for each fifth grader or whoever, I, you know, I would sort of applaud that more so than, oh, here goes an iPad to go and play games on or to look up yeah. stuff on the internet. But apparently, I mean, this is, this is a huge trend. That's not, I mean, it's not going to slow down or be reversed in any sort of reality that we live in, you know, uh -huh. <clears throat> and move. So moving on. Um, so we have that, that's big news. There's also, um, I guess, uh, Williams Jewel College in Liberty, Liberty, Liberty uh, Montana. They opened their first um, bookless all digital library, and that they actually cite a cost for that. That was 15 million, which is um, 15 million. Yeah, that's a that's pretty insane. penny. I mean, I guess not so much for a new library, but um, you know, for for a small school like that, I'm sure it was it was quite a investment of time. In, in other news, um, in, Google was in the news again. They're supposed to open their uh, MOOC.org site pretty soon, and that's just going to be um, – that's with edX, and um, it should be um, a massive online open course platform that anybody can create a course on. That um, sounds cool. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, they have their course builder software, um, which is – uh, Python based and they're supposed to actually incorporate that into the into the platform but you should be able to like they'll host your your class for um, 
for free, basically. Um, there may be ads appearing, but you could create a class on anything and have people enroll and follow along. Um, and I, I found that that um, I'm in my second massive online open course with uh, through San Jose State. The it's called the um, the digital or the the hyperlinked library. And I mean, it's a huge class. I think there's 800 people in it. But um, I've I've found you know they have videos of instruction and assignments, and it's really uh, engaging and and sort of you know fun for. A librarian to continue to build upon their skills, so I'm I'm currently doing that, and that's been a, a quite a quite a fun time. Can any you any thoughts? Uh, can you self-host Course Builder? Yeah, yeah. Oh, you can. Okay, mm -hmm. that that was my only that was a question because we may consider that at my school. But yeah, so I'm actually building um, for our student assistants a sort of introduction to libraries, you know, to make sure that they know the Library of Congress call number system, they know how to find a book, how to check in and out a book. And we're going to we're going to build this and have them do it before they even come to their first day of work, which will save us quite a bit of time with training and sort of getting them acclimated to uh, working in a library. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so I guess we're going to move right along. Um, you wanted to we're going to kind of just talk about DSpace. So, yeah, uh, so we're going to talk about DSpace. It was installed, I guess, locally um, at work, so I can't access that site. I haven't done any customization or anything, but I believe that um, – let me go ahead and share my screen. They installed it using Jumpbox. Uh, let's see. Uh, oh, hi. Oh, there I am. Oh. Oh, it's the D. Space. Can can you see the D space now? Uh, oh no? yeah, I can see see that. Okay, so this is their basic repository. Um, you have your search. It would basically look like this. Recently added, you can um, have different communities where you could have pictures or oral histories, uh, theses, which we're going to basically be using ours for. The installation is somewhat complex. I would recommend if you are thinking about it and um, you are you don't have real IT support, there is the jump box. Can you see that, Riley? Uh, yeah, I can see the jump box. Yeah, so um, the jump box uh, you do have to sub pay, but you get um, you get a free trial, so you can download the jump box. Well, this it's one's basically... free. I checked. The, this... well, oh, is it? I think this jump box is free. Cause I think I think I had to still sign up. Oh. But I mean, it's so easy to install once you have um, once you have the um, the virtual uh, platform running. Oh, I never even saw this. You um. You just you just click a a, a file within the um the jump box D space download and you know it, it basically uh, installs it right there on your you can install it for Windows or Mac or uh, Linux and I have not tried installing the jump box on a server as of yet um, I'm working with my IT department sort of once again and I'm not sure if they're uh, gonna be receptive to that so am I back? Oh yes, you're back. Oh, there we go. Yes. Thanks. So, uh, so uh, if you if you're looking at you know experimenting with the jump box or experimenting with DSpace, um, the benefits of DSpace, uh, you know, it's a free, open source software. You're not paying anybody. The other leading software for archival or um, electronic archival format would be Content DM. It's run by. Uh, OCLC and you're looking at even if you go with the hosted um, D space it's a fraction of the cost of what you're going to be paying for content DM and and you know you're really giving back to a community you're you're you know you're furthering the the 
advances of, of the technology. And, and one thing to point out, if someone says, well, you know, open source software is unreliable, it was, it was created in conjunction with MIT. And, and this, you know, schools that are using this, MIT, Harvard, uh, most of the UC system schools, I know UC Irvine is, is a big supporter of uh, DSpace. And it's once you have it up and running, if you do have a depart, uh, a IT department that's receptive to um, and, and knowledgeable to install oh, hi, something, Duke space. Yeah, yeah, Duke, Duke's a big, big supporter too. Um, yeah, so if you have a, a IT department that's knowledgeable about this, once it's up and running, it's completely web-based. You don't have to, um, uh, besides customizing it, you know, adding your own header, footer, stuff like that. Um, it's basically all web-based, and you you can upload documents. I showed someone with no computer experience how to upload documents, create new repositories, and compared to other open source open to repositories, it, it's com it, you know it's far beyond anything. I mean, I even think you know compared to the um, commercial content DM, and I mean, it is made by a nonprofit, but you're looking at, I think it's initial uh, 10 grand to get the software for a content DM, and that's installing it on your own servers compared Jeez. to, yeah. I Wait, mean, so that's how, just, how much is it? I think it's initial investment of $10,000 just for the software. So you're, I mean, it, it's a platform that's, that's used by quite a few schools, but you know, I mean, what what is that getting you really? The the support for DSpace is so phenomenal. Um, if you join the DSpace uh, tech uh, listserv, you you every question is answered. It's not sort of um, willy nilly. I, yeah, go ahead, Riley. Because I've seen open source projects that they have this listserv and they have this form and you post to it and you might get your question answered, but maybe. You know what I mean? Right. So I don't know if they have paid um, techs that go on there and answer these questions, but you see this similar people that are, I, I would say, you know, basically architects of the system that they're that are that knowledgeable, um, and and every question, there's not one question that goes by with, you know, sorry, I can't help you. It's you know, send me more files or give me more screenshots, and it seems like. You know, from my cursory um, scanning of all the all the listserv emails and posts, it's 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 phenomenal. The the support is really really next level. And and you know, with with open repository or or institutional repositories, we're we're not just thinking the next five years or ten years. You know, we're trying to. Um, preserve this stuff for you know 100, 200 years, which which sort of um, you know is is I guess that's a concern of a lot of people. You know, is is this is this software going to be around and maintained in in that that long of a period? And I mean, my opinion is it is, and they they're conforming to all the same standards as Content DM, which is mm -hmm. you know it, 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 they're they're definitely looking towards the future which I would say is is pretty much what repository software should do. <laughs> any 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 uh, thoughts or uh... I just think looking towards the future the um most important thing is that the documents and the papers that are published by professors and by um students at the universities those should remain as free and open source as possible to promote um, information sharing, and I think DSpace is a great step in that direction. Right. So, so when we're talking about open repositories, we're not just talking about what platform we're going to use. Um, we also, you you have to remember, you need to develop a policy within your university, and every single student who who produces or wants to contribute to that repository, um, as well as faculty members. But I mean, students are sort of more, more transient. So if you have all these theses from 20 years ago, you're going to have to track down all those people to get them to resign a release um, so that you can go ahead and publish those online. Um, one thing that we ran into, um, some blowback, uh, our, our policy is about to be approved. I was sort of the main um, writer of it, but uh, one insistence by faculty was 
that we do offer uh, up to a three-year embargo. But in doing that, we do at least we have them sign the piece of paper, and within three years, we will be able to publish that online. Which I, I mean, I said you know give them five years if if they're really that concerned. And I mean, their main concern is publishing their thesis, you know, commercially. Oh, because they wanna they wanna make some money off of it. Well, right. and that, and I think they want recognition. You know, if you oh. get it published, you get a, a, a snippet published in a journal, or, and I, I, I can't see that many master's level students publishing theses. Um, maybe they can turn them into an article or something, but I can't imagine. But we are starting the doctoral program in education, and maybe those people would look for some sort of publishing opportunity because they are getting a doctorate in, in education. Mm -hmm. And okay, and so yeah, that that's definitely um, a great look at DSpace. Um, if you have any questions about it, you can send us an email. Um, and and uh, and if you if and uh, conversely, if you have implemented DSpace recently, or if you're a contributor to the um, code of DSpace, we'd love to have you on and sort of talk about your experience with it or uh, your contributions to it. So so hit us up for that as well. Because we, we really like to hear from people who have actually used it and have actually implemented rather than just in our situation where we've downloaded it and started to play around with it. Um, yeah. Right, and I'll, I'll keep reporting back um, which, what route we're going to go. But if you do have um, a somewhat inflexible IT department, there are hosting options that I, uh, I'll look into and we'll do another show maybe in the future about, about those options and sort of <clears throat> how, how, how much money you're looking to invest compared to a commercial option. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, so we need to work on our transitions, they're really awkward. Um, so Next up, um, we're going to be going back on to a reoccurring thing um, about mobile device management. And I have this wonderful iPad here. Um, no Android tablet, unfortunately. I just have this iPad because it's my dad's and he's letting me borrow it. Um, and I am hopefully going to be able to do this. Let's give this a shot. Okay. So, so what, are, what are you trying to do here, Riley? Give us a little explanation. Um, I'm trying just to give you a little look at, there we go, same thing just happened. Um, I'm trying to give you a look at a piece of software called Cisco Meraki. Even though it's not open, um, I know that the, I guess the golden goose, and um, there's a couple, um, the golden goose in this, in uh, mobile device management would probably have to be either, I think it's either TechServe um, in the situation just in general, um, and then there's Lion Server, which is like, um, which is what the local school district is using, um, and the licensing for that is insane, is what my understanding is. Let me see, I'm going to log in to my school's network. Okay, oops. Oh, okay. And so as you can see, I'm logging in, and I have a network called um, LTC Test Network. Um, and I do actually have, I have the client installed, I believe, I'm hoping it's here. It should, yes. So, I mean, I have the client installed on a, several laptops and I mean that was simply so that I could push out um, a piece of software that our IT firm needed so that they could push out antivirus um, and this was just easier to do than pushing out their client because um, it doesn't work very well their client doesn't can't be pushed out via group policy um, which for those of you that know what that is that's something in Windows that allows you to manage all your things uh, and stuff but Basically, um, that now I'm gonna be. This is basically all the stuff here. Uh, you got your QR. 
I think we lost you, Riley. Are you still there? Yeah. Oh, yeah, you cut out for a second. Yeah, I did? Oh, oops. Okay. Uh, skip. So basically, I'm going to go back over that. Um, so this is just, this is how you would enroll something. And you can do a whole bunch of stuff. You can push out apps to your devices. Um, uh, you can configure configure everything so you can lock it down, put restrictions on it. Um, I haven't added anything yet, but okay. I'm going to do that right now. So uh, basically what we're going to do is we are going to enroll. Hang on, let me switch out of screen share. Freak out. Okay. So we're going to enroll this iPad. Yeah, there we go. This iPad, um, which is actually running iOS 7, into our test network. And it's really, really straightforward. Um, you just go in your in your web browser in Safari. Oh, can you? Yeah, yeah, you can see it. Oh, um, so, so with iOS 7, there's been some reports that uh, people have been having problems connecting to to wireless. And actually, um, have you ever heard of Library Box? Oh yeah, I have. I have. Yeah. So uh, he was saying that the iOS 7 um, is not is not compatible with with uh, the current Library Box. Uh, yeah, I think I think because it's look, um, iOS is looking for an internet connection, and with Library Box, you're not always going to get that internet connection. Um, right. Right. Yeah. yeah. Because I think it's, always... yeah, it's doing weird stuff too, where it's sending out, it's looking for a whole bunch of different internet connections within some sort of domain or something. I don't know. I read some article about it. I'm not completely clear as to as to the problem. Because I mean, um, and I actually, yeah, and I mean that that's a problem there because Library Box looks awesome, and maybe we should do that next week or something. There, we're a little flexible on that, uh, so we could take a look at that maybe at a later date, maybe in a couple weeks. Um, but yeah, so this uh, basically is the enrollment screen. There's an ID that you put in that box right there, and it's just at m.meraki.com. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, pull up my ID. So this, so this will basically um, work. You work a, as uh, you'll be able to control what apps that the iPad uses. That yeah, correct. Um, so basically, oh man, it happened so fast. Uh, so it said uh, Meraki set it complete, and um, so I, I I'm gonna and it bring then it brings you to that, which is just the iOS, and you click um, you click install. And so basically, you're you're sort of showing us how to install this on on the um, iPad. Yeah, yeah. I let's see. Yes. Okay. Perfect. And yeah, so it's really it's really straightforward, really simple. Um, and okay, and it's gonna warn you that I I'll, that you can manage uh, that someone will be able to manage your iPad. Um, but I'm really Very just cool. taking. Yeah. Um, and then. Yeah, and then it actually it shows up uh, monitor the interface is a little wonky um, and yeah see it just showed up right away uh, and I can uh, manage it I can erase it, which I'm not going to do. I can um, actually, I watch. This is actually cool. So, give me a second. So display the lock screen on the device. Yes. So I just oh wait. Oh, and it locks automatic. You can click um, lock device, and it will lock the device. Um, but and, and then how can, how how secure is that? The lock the device. Um. Well. Actually, what it is is you would you, once again you would use this with like Find My iPhone um, because you can't like put it into lost mode through this, which is unfortunate. Um, oops. Uh, so yeah. So and then you can configure a profile, and I can say um, 
We're just going to call that Manage Sessions. Uh, we're not going to allow the to remove this profile. We're going to require a password to remove the profile. And it's going to create that. And uh, you can click on Profiles. Back to Profiles. And uh, no, 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 no. where is it? Oh, whatever. Um, oh, wait, here it is, settings. Yeah, okay. there it is. There it is. <laughs> That's how you create the profile. My bad. I, I haven't uh, used this in a while. Um, so you can create restrictions on it, actually. So um, you can, let's say, I don't want them to use the camera or install apps or screen capture or dial anything or automatic sync or use Siri. Um, so if anybody's looking for an iPad management system or they're thinking about deploying iPads in their library, this would be a great resource to sort of control those. This also works for Android. This does actually also work for Android. I just don't have an Android tablet to show you. So if anybody, um, so you can deploy these, Nexus these, tablets. Cool. Yeah. These exact settings will actually um, translate straight over to um. Uh, no, you definitely do not want to allow bookstore erotica. Um, <laughs> uh, but yeah, um, in an enterprise environment, you can require a passcode. Um, you can automatically push out Wi-Fi settings. So, uh, and there's just some other stuff. Uh, oh, what the heck is geofencing? Oh, that's neat. Oh, Just and show yeah. you where your iPad uh, is. Yeah, you can prevent it from leaving um, an iPad. Um, and I guess this is like credentials for um, websites and stuff. Uh, no, I, I bet you it's like SSL certificates. Um, and you can push out apps by clicking the apps thing. Um, like, let's just say I wanted to push out. Mm, uh, there's something called like from Siri Dynex. I remember what it was called. Um, let's just say I want to do Angry Birds. To all my um, to all my iPads. Oh wait, okay, that's how you do it. iOS app. Yeah, and I mean, it does a whole bunch of stuff. Um, everything from wiping the iPad to uh, being able to say, you can't leave this area, otherwise the iPad will be dis disabled. Uh, and, and save changes. And then if you, and then, yeah. So that's basically that. Um... And in a minute, Angry Birds will actually start to show up on the iPad. Um, that's very cool. Very cool stuff. Yeah, but that that's um that's act is 100% free. There is um, if you would like to, you can uh, upgrade to an enterprise license, um, which basically gives you 24-hour phone support. Um, and they have a line of access points and a line of network appliances, which are fantastic. That work really, really well, and I've been playing around with some of those. Um, and that is actually the free low budget solution and it's just as full featured as a Lion server that you would deploy to manage these things um, and so I, do, you, and I, do you have the, the custom support or the um, support? no okay. I mean I don't I don't have any money to <laughs> I don't have any money at my school to do this sort of stuff so I have um, email support um, but if you do have their access points there isn't any you, it's a 150 yearly fee for if you have an access point. Um, you purchase the access point, and then their cloud management is used on like uh, oh, I didn't bring it home with me. It's at my school, um, but like an access point or a network switch. Um, but it's all really really cool stuff, and I encourage you to check it out. Uh, it's really easy to set up. There, it's like your email. You you put an email. You put in a password. You put in a username. 
um, takes like five minutes to set up. So it's it's really cool, uh, and I encourage you just to check it out. Um, but we're gonna wrap it up here, I guess. So if you want to wrap it up, Jeff. Yeah. So thanks for joining us. Um, if you want to support us, all we ask is that you tell a friend. Um, if you enjoyed the show, sort of spread the word. And um, we're always looking for guests, so hit us up uh, at our email or uh, the Library Tech Cast website. And uh, I'll throw it over to you, Riley, to say the last goodbyes. Uh, I would just like to say goodbye. Don't forget to follow us on Twitter. We're at Library Tech Cast. Send us an email, ltc at rileychilds.net. Soon we will be getting a domain, librarytechcast.com. Um, but for now, just want to say goodbye. Uh, I'm Riley Childs. And I'm Jeff Sable. Have a great week. You just listened to an episode of the Library Tech Cast. Join us next week on Friday at 6.30 p.m. Eastern Time when we will be discussing OCLC's interlibrary loan program, WorldShare. You can now find us on Stitcher Radio. You can download the app on Google Play or the iOS App Store. Have a great week.